My name is Lee and I am one of the historical interpreters here at San Cayach Vaur Living History Museum. Now if you've been watching any of the online content that we've been putting out during lockdown then you'll get an impression of the level of historical accuracy that we like to maintain here at San Cayach Vaur. When visitors come into the house um, everything that they see, we like it to be as accurate, period accurate as possible to 1645, the period of the Civil War. We dress in period costumes, we have a skilled team of seamstresses who measure us and make our costumes for us. And even the ephemeral pieces around the house, uh, documents that are written, uh, we like everything to look as close to the original as possible. We don't use originals, even though we have them, because we like visitors to be able to have a tactile experience, to come in, to be able to touch things, to pick things up, to read the documents and books. So obviously, historic documents wouldn't last long. Now, the documents that we do produce, they are on period accurate paper, but what a lot of people might not realize is that we are accurate right down to the ink that we use. We use oak gall ink and we actually make it here ourselves. Now very occasionally we do demonstrate the making of the ink but it's not an everyday occurrence. Um, as you can imagine you make a pint of ink it'll take a long time to use it. So I'm going to show you exactly how we make the ink that we use here at Llankai Achfawr. Now the first thing that you'd have to do if you were making some oak gall ink is go out into the woods and find some oak galls. Now these are our oak galls. These are harvested from the oak tree and they're created when a small creature, the oak wasp, injects its eggs into a small branch. And that causes a wound to the tree, which the tree heals by infusing the wound with tannin and it creates these small galls. Now eventually the grub inside will hatch, it'll burrow out and fly off and we are left with these oak galls and these are important because it's the tannin that we want. Now we take these and we crush them in a pestle and mortar. Um, again this is one of the few things we have around the house that is original. This is from about 1620. Originally, it would have been an apothecary's pestle and mortar. So we place the oak galls in, and then using the pestle, we grind them into a very fine powder. Fortunately, it's also possible these days to buy pre-ground oak gall powder, still used by artisan dyers. When we have our oak gall, we have to add it to rainwater. Now there is a book, uh, it's entitled A Book of Secrets. It was published in 1596 and the reason it's called A Book of Secrets is because the, the production of ink and pigments for artists and that sort of thing was a very, very closely guarded secret. It was, uh, it was almost considered to be magical by some people. But in 1596 a book was published and it lists all sorts of really bright and vibrant colours. But we don't have to worry about vibrance today, we're just looking for some basic oak gall ink. So we put our rainwater into our pan. This is a, an 18th century copper skillet. That goes on to a chafing dish. Now, using a chafing dish would be a very smoky and dirty experience. So we have a simple camping stove. So, we'll put our pan onto the camping stove and add some water. Now we've brought the water up to something just under simmering temperature. So we need to add now our oak galls. Now these would have been, as I said, crushed in a pestle and mortar, but fortunately we have some pre-ground stuff. Uh, you don't actually need a great deal of this, so just a small amount, you know, just kind of a, just over a level stirring spoon. We put it into our water and give it a good stir. 
Now it doesn't take very long for this to mix into the water. It doesn't dissolve, it remains a solid, so when we've finished the ink we have to strain it, but the, the hot water allows now uh, the tannin to leach out because it's the tannin that we're interested in. But tannin on its own doesn't make a particularly good ink. So what we need to do is add something to it. And that stuff is this. Copperas, or more commonly known today as iron sulfate. You can get it in the garden center. People put it in soil. I think it makes the soil more acidic. But this contains two elements, sulfur and iron. And it's the iron we're interested in because when we put this into the water that contains the tannin, the tannin causes the iron to oxidize and immediately it will turn black. Um, you can see why some people thought it was quite magical because the effect is pretty much instantaneous. Now in true 17th century fashion, I'm not gonna measure it out. Um, you read any of the old, certainly any of the old uh, cooking recipes, it'll never say exactly how much or very rarely, it'll say things like, uh, cast there to enough or put there in a handful but just enough so that it allows the the tannin and the iron to react and it will turn very very dark in color but this is it's no good for writing with it's far too thin at the moment if you attended to write with it it would just make the paper so wet it would fall apart so we need to thicken it and for that we need this gum arabic now this would have been one of the expensive ingredients of the time this was imported from north africa um, it's the sun hardened sap that comes from the acacia tree it was used in kitchens or the very best kitchens uh, for thickening foods it was used for making pastes sugar pastes and that sort of thing but add it to our ink and it does make a very good thickener. Now, again, we're fortunate. It's still used in the food industry today. You can buy it pre-ground in very, very fine powdered form. We don't need a great deal of it, just a very, very small amount. And then just keep the ink moving until the gum arabic has completely dissolved. Now, it doesn't take very long. A couple of minutes have passed, and it's now almost entirely dissolved into the liquid and as you can see it's turned a very robust black what would have been known back then as charcoal black that ink now is essentially finished once that has cooled and you've strained it that is very much ready for use but there were additions that you could make to your ink um, if for instance you made a very large batch of it then you could put it into a large bottle and stopper it and put it on a shelf, but it didn't have a particularly long shelf life. Within a couple of weeks, it would start to degrade, you'd get a mold growing on it, and with evaporation, it would soon degrade into nothing. It would be unusable. Uh, so there were ways of preserving it, one of which was using a very common item, or certainly very common today, not so common back then. Again, this would have been one of your expensive kitchen spices. These are cloves. Now, cloves today are used for, for flavor and to give, uh, give nice aromas to things. It's a smell that a lot of people associate with Christmas. But all we need to do is just add a couple of those cloves into our mixture. Let those infuse and that will allow us to preserve our ink. There are also other things that you could add to your ink. If, for instance, you were using um, very cheap paper, this is quite good paper, but if you were using very cheap paper, the chances are that you dip your quill into your inkwell, but as soon as the quill touched the paper, the paper would act like a sponge, and it would just draw all the ink into the paper. It would be unreadable. So what you could do is crush and powder some of these things. These are hazelnut shells. Now, hazelnut shells, uh, they impart something into the, into the mixture that when you write with it, write with the ink, it allows the ink to sit on top of the paper. And as it dries, then you'd sprinkle salt onto it and the salt would allow it to bind to the paper. So you could use cheap paper, but still produce a legible document. 
Um, if you needed to dry the ink very quickly, say you were in a hurry, you'd written uh, a list of food that you needed from the market and you had to give it to your servant quick and send them off, then you could dry the ink quite quickly using this stuff. Now this was known as silver sand, which is an odd name because it's not silver and there's no sand in it. But this is still a very common item today. This is cuttlefish. Now most people today will be familiar with cuttlefish if they keep uh, budgerigars or parrots. You stick it through the bars of their cage and they nibble on it, keeps their beaks in good order. But the thing about cuttlefish is when it's dried, when you scrape it, it scrapes to a very, very fine absorbent powder. And this silver sand would then be placed into a vessel such as this. Again, this is a, an original silver sand holder. And when you'd written it, then you would use it to sprinkle over the document it would absorb the excess ink, it would dry, then you could brush it off, again, polish it with your tooth, and off you'd be, you, off you'd go, you'd be away. So, ink making, certainly for everyday black ink, was a reasonably easy thing to do. Um, it wasn't something that you could buy at the market, you'd have to make it yourself. Everybody who had a scrivener in the house, they knew that that scrivener would have his own particular ink recipe. This is how I make mine. Another Scrivener might make it in an entirely different way. Now, there are other colours that can be made, but they're beyond the scope of this short film. Maybe I'll show you how to make red or blue or green in another video. But if you're enjoying these videos, videos then please do, uh, please do give us a like. Please do comment on them. We always enjoy reading the comments. And hopefully, when all this is over, you'll come and visit us here at Llancaerchfawr Living History Museum. Until then, oil